Welcome again to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program in which we take an intergenerational look at the book of Revelation. And I have with me uh, Shifra Fepulea'i uh, from the uh, Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda. And I have Nick Snell from the University Church in Loma Linda and also Guillerme Borda, who is a doctoral student at Andrews University. Uh, but is able to be with us today uh, by Zoom, and we're glad for all of you. So thank you for that. Um, Guillerme, would you kindly read the text again? Uh, this is Revelation 12 and verse 17. Yes, definitely. And it's a very rich text uh, because it kind of summarizes the second half of the book of Revelation. So we're going to spend time in this text because it's really, really important. Then when we get past it, we can move more quickly. Go ahead. So today I'm reading from the Lexham English Bible. And it says, And the dragon was angry at the woman and went away to fight against the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and who hold to the testimony about Jesus. Okay, so you see here you have a remnant, the rest of her offspring. Uh, it's just a different translation. But you have a remnant at the end of time who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. So it's kind of important, I think, to understand the commission for the end times to know what's this testimony of Jesus all about. What do you think? Nick from Azure Hills, uh, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, if Did I could I that introduced <laughs> as uh, in from the university church, they might need to send me a check. But... <laughs> uh, I'm confusing you with Philip on that one. Okay, sorry about that, uh, folk. Uh, we have with us uh, Nick Snell, and he is uh, one of the pastors at the Azure Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. Nick, take it over. Sure. <laughs> I had a huge smile during that introduction. Thank you. That was good. Um, so I think that having the testimony of Jesus Christ is, I think it can really refer to um, the prophets speaking the message of Jesus. So John, the apostle writing Revelation, for example, is sharing the testimony of Jesus. And I honestly think that Throughout time, um, e even beyond scripture, God can continue to give his testimony through people. People can have prophetic roles, uh, even up to our time. It can certainly happen. Um, so I think some people have made this a pretty narrow interpretation of it can only be, you know, one person. But I think the testimony of Jesus can actually, it can come through us today. We're, we have a prophetic ministry in a sense, um, proclaiming God's truth uh, to people who can be encouraged and uplifted by that. And, and how did you come to the idea that testimony of Jesus is prophetic? Um, well, it's because we were talking to Guillerme before this program started, so I'll let him take that. <laughs> okay, take it away, Here, Guillerme. Well, in Revelation 19, verse 10, um, we have, and it's very delightful when we have this in the book of Revelation. Unfortunately, we don't have that for every single symbol or expression. But in uh, chapter 19, verse 10, toward the end of that verse, the, the angel says to John, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it says, I'm a fellow slave of you and of your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, so it's you can, actually this passage not only illuminates the testimony of Jesus, but illuminates the idea that there's people who hold the testimony of Jesus. So John's brothers those who hold um, to the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Very interestingly, uh, and because uh, Nick was saying, somehow uh, this expression, you know, uh, uh, has a broad uh, application in terms of history, because you go to verse 2. Uh, John says, who testified, speaking about himself, in chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 2, the very second verse of the, of the, of the letter, 
testified about the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, all that he saw, which would seem that somehow the testimony of, of Jesus or the testimony about Jesus in this second verse of the book is tightly connected with the message of the book of Revelation. But then you have in chapter 19, verse 10, it is the spirit of prophecy. And then you have um, in, in, in verse 9, chapter 1, verse 9, that, that John says, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the testimony of Jesus, you know, has to do with, with like what Nick was saying, is God provides um, through uh, the spirit of prophecy. He provides uh, prophetic revelation and he testifies about Jesus, what he does through Jesus, salvation, the message of the gospel. But we would also see that the message of Jesus, all that John saw, is not only about Jesus died on the cross, he resurrected, but involves many things about the Christian journey. It involves the controversy between good and evil. I, I, I would say that everything that you see in Revelation is somehow related to the essence of what the testimony of Jesus is about that could be manifested in many uh, historical periods, I would say. I think that's fascinating what you pointed out in verse, verse 9, that John was on Patmos for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because I don't know, like, Revelation is considered a prophetic book, right? It's a book of prophecy, God's prophetic surprises. That's what we're all about. <laughs> and up until that point in his life, had he as far as we know or have recorded, had he prophesied like this, had a vision like this, I don't know that he had. It seems like he had simply been preaching Jesus, right? And so would that be considered, you know, uh, the testimony of Jesus to be preaching about Christ specifically? I don't know. Well, I think you've, you've all clearly established that Whatever we mean by testimony of Jesus, it's not limited to the end of time. Now, mm -hmm. twelve in chapter 12, you're kind of going to the end of time, the final battle between the dragon and the remnant. So there's an end time component, but it, it has to be something that's also valid uh, at the time that John is writing. Yeah. There's a couple little pieces here. Let me, let me add in. Uh, going back to chapter 19, verse 10. Guillermo, you're probably aware of this, but it doesn't say in the Greek, the spirit of prophecy. It says the spirit of the prophecy. Wow. Now, in Greek, that can be taken two different ways. It could be like a demonstrative pronoun, the spirit of this prophecy. And if that was the case, then it would be speaking directly of the book of Revelation, mm. as you have suggested. But there's another possibility, and that is Greek, like French and, and, and German and other languages, uh, can sometimes use the definite article in an abstract form. They don't just say love, they say the love. Mm. They don't just say beauty, they say the beauty. You see, mm -hmm. so it's it's the abstract requires an article sometimes. So you have those two possibilities in Revelation 19.10 that uh, it could be speaking directly of the book of Revelation itself, or it could be speaking in a more abstract sense, the spirit of prophecy, the prophetic gift. Mm -hmm. Now, one more little piece, I think, can help to settle that issue. Just a little bit, and that's coming back to chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, you have a three-stage chain of revelation. You have the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. And then you have the testimony of Jesus, which John saw. And then you have the words of this prophecy, which John saw wrote all right i would take that there's no question that the spirit of prophecy the testimony of jesus is critical to the production of the book of revelation but it is not itself the book of revelation 
it produces the book of Revelation when John writes it out. So the reference, it seems to me, is particularly on the visionary gift that John has. And what Revelation 12, 17 is saying is that in the last days of earth's history, God's people at the end of time will have a visionary prophetic gift like John's. Mm. So we should not be surprised if God sends a prophetic surprise to us as well. Now, speaking as a Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Adventists have understood that to mean that the gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of prophecy, are still available to the church, and we should expect God uh, to do so, and uh, that Adventists believe he has done so uh, with uh, at least one individual in the past. So uh, it, it seems to me that the remnant in Revelation 12, 17, uh, it is going to have a focus on obedience, but it's also going to have uh, a, a prophetic gift kind of like John's in its midst. So any claim to be the remnant that would have no evidence of the gift of prophecy being exercised uh, would be a false claim. Mm. Just because you have that gift doesn't mean you're the remnant by itself. Okay. It, that doesn't work uh, both ways, but the expectation is that God's end time people would have an active uh, ministry of the prophetic gifts. Does that make any sense? It does. And it reminds me of Acts chapter two, verse 17. Can I read it? Oh, by all means. And I was thinking of that before, but you, uh, you thought of it when it mattered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank you. So it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And it goes on. So Pentecost was an amazing time of the gifts of the spirit, including the gift of prophecy. And Peter, speaking there in Acts 2, says, at the end of time, what's happening today is going to happen again. Hmm. So those who expect a special outpouring of the Spirit at the end of time, Revelation here supports uh, that idea very much. Hmm. And uh, One thing I would just say, uh, I totally agree with you that uh, I didn't mean to say that it is the book of Revelation. But I do think that the book of Revelation is a manifestation, especially when you think that 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 it is said to, to, to John in 1910 uh, of your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Depending on how you understand this, depending on how you understand this, could not be limited to the book of Revelation, especially because, I mean, if it's if it's those people who already hold, then it, I mean, John is the only one that has the book of Revelation at that moment. Right. He has not. Well, in chapter 22, you have an almost exact copy of 1910. Hmm. Except instead of saying those who have the testimony of Jesus, it says your brothers, the prophets. Interesting. So tying the testimony of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy to the gift uh, seems to be clear at that point. I, I think you're absolutely right, though. You know, when you look at the spirit of the prophecy, you could read that as applying directly to the book of Revelation. So it isn't, it isn't foolish to make that suggestion uh, whatsoever. Uh, but when you look at all the evidence, I'm inclined to think that John is saying uh, that, that God gives certain gifts, and those gifts will not be limited to the first century, but will be, will be seen again uh, at the end of time. Now, there's an interesting thing about the testimony about Jesus holding to it and then the interaction with the dragon and the beasts um when you go through the book and you see uh those expressions testimony of jesus testimony about jesus and just even testimony uh you come across uh, for example chapter 20 verse 4 which i think has a lot of hope and i think it's very important uh, in the message of Revelation, because it says, and I saw the souls, 
kind of the second sentence here. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony about Jesus. But then toward the end of the verse, it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And we know that the dragon makes war with God's witnesses. Would Could the those... testimony of Jesus be like a flag that can mean different things at different times? Well, I think that uh, if the testimony of Jesus is the gift of prophecy, then it is something that is living, uh-huh. right? That as God reveals more and more, that it can, is almost, because well, the spirit is living, the spirit is active, yeah. his spirit is working, right. and he can reveal more and more about God. But like my, but my point I'm trying to draw is that there's a price to holding on to this. Mm-hmm. The price is the dragon makes war with those who are God's witnesses, as we see in chapter 11, and he works to kill those who hold the testimony of Jesus. But, but the hope is hope. they will live and they will reign with mm-hmm. him. So even when it seems that God's people, those who hold the testimony of Jesus and obey him, those who decide to obey God rather than the beast, those who decide to hold on to the testimony of Jesus rather than listen to the lies of the, of the dragon and the serpent, those who hold on to the heavenly things, it may look like they are defeated. Like the two witnesses in chapter 11, they may be beheaded. They may be like the souls under the altar. Mm-hmm. They're like, how long, how long? Mm-hmm. But they are victorious. As we see in chapter 11, when the two witnesses are, are brought back to life, in chapter 20, those who were beheaded, they are brought back to life and they reign with Christ. So the hope is we should hold on to the testimony of Jesus, to God's revelations, because it means when we hold on to him, we are victorious no matter what happens. And Jesus said Jesus said to, um, to Martha, and John recorded that in his gospel, in chapter 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? We have so, to believe this. So the hmm. same spirit that hovered over the waters in creation. Uh, come on. Uh, that inspired the word of God that raised Jesus from the dead will one day uh, raise those who have been martyred and others who have been faithful to Jesus. So Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a theme running throughout the Bible, but let's, let's get to this remnant thing. All right. It's talking about the final battle of earth's history is summarized in chapter 12, verse 17. This is kind of the, the keystone or hinge text it's the climax of chapter 12, where you've had uh, started with the birth of Jesus Christ, even before that to uh, a war in heaven uh, that the, where the dragon dragged down a third of the angels. And you come to the end of time, the final battle is between the dragon and a remnant. Uh, loipos is, is the Greek word. And uh, who is this remnant? What, how do you understand the remnant? Concept. So far, all I know from our conversation is whoever the remnant is uh, or are, they have the commandments of God, which heavily hinges on the Ten Commandments, both co- covenantal and prophetic relationships there, and have the gift of prophecy, which is connected to the test of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Okay. And we're talking last days here. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So in the last days, there will be a people uh, who is called here remnant, and uh, they'll be marked by faithfulness to the commandments and the presence of of the prophetic gift. Anything more to say about it? I would say we should... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. I just want to be clear, Nick. Like, what does it mean? Like, do I have to have, do I have to be Ellen White? Do I have to, what does it mean? Like the remnant in the last days who are going to, yeah, maybe be beheaded, but they'll reign or, or sorry, that's, is that, did I just confuse that? Okay. Like <laughs> who, what? Okay. Go ahead, Nick. Well, 
I, I was thinking earlier about this. Um, I heard a pastor that I really enjoy listening to saying that a lot of times we will um, say that we believe everything we believe because the Bible tells me so, right? Like Jesus loves me, this I know. Or, or the, the Bible. Bible tells me so, right? And he would actually say, you know what? I believe what the Bible says because Jesus believed what it says. So Jesus is the, like, they kind of like, they build up each other. Like the Old Testament's pointing to Jesus. And then some people, for example, maybe have a hard time believing in the flood. But Jesus made some statements um, in, the, in the gospels that showed that he believed in that. And he believed in Adam and Eve. And, you know, like, so he was, he was saying his argument. And the part that sticks out with me is like, whoever says I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life again and actually pulls that off. You should listen to whatever they say. <laughs> like, just go with that. <laughs> and and, and mm-hmm. so Jesus did that. And so, of course, the Old Testament points to him. And Jesus then, you know, reinforces his ministry and, and the Old Testament. So they strengthen each other. And so I think what I'm getting from that pastor and what I just said is that the most important thing is that we hold on to Jesus, right? And yeah. Jesus, um, it, is, it is the testimony of Jesus. It's, it's, we talked about this prophecy, but Jesus also reinforces the commandments, right? Um, so I, I see Jesus reinforcing both of those things. And I think that saying that there's this remnant, it means that they are, are the ones who are still going in that path, who are still holding on to the commandments and the testimony of Jesus, where others may have one or the other, but they don't have both. People have kind of branched off in different ways. But these are the people that are still around that are holding on to both the Come testimony on. of Jesus and the commandment. So that's yeah. what I'm thinking. So good. Now, I think there's a danger of people thinking, okay, if I can find a church that has these two characteristics, as long as I'm a member of that church, I'm the remnant. Saved by label. <laughs> but, the, but the problem is, these are people who have, who hold on to mm. the testimony of Jesus to the point of death. Now that is very different than being a member in a list. Mm. <laughs> you can Come be on. in a list anytime. But if you're not willing to die for what God reveals to us, you're not a member of the remnant. Because the remnants, the, the, those who are the remnants, they hold on to that. They have it. It's theirs. Not even Satan can snatch it away from them. Whew. They would rather die than give it up. Whew. That's, you know, so the remnant, they're characterized by the virtue of courage. Doesn't mean you have to, you know, courage is often misunderstood. But courage understood as a spiritual virtue has to do with this uncompromising, relentless holding on to Jesus that I would rather die than deny my Lord and my Savior, right? And it's no wonder that the book of Revelation says that outside of the city are the cowards. Wow. Mm. It's very interesting, you know, of course, this could be, when we get there to discuss maybe in episode 1022, but we will we'll talk about this. But uh, but virtue of courage is very important in the book of Revelation. So I think the remnant are those who hold on to it to a certain extent that, look, if you really believe what Jesus says, that those who believe in him, you know, they will live, then you should not fear anything that is thrown your way. Now, of course, there's our flesh. It's difficult, but we just have to hold on to Jesus, hold on to him. Preacher Borda, um, I just wanted to add to your appeals as well as Preacher Snell and Preacher Pauline. Um, I think about like a parent and a child, like which good father, which good mother would be like, oh, renounce my love for my baby to live? Like easy, I renounce my love. Like no way, you know, like the parent will be like, I will die before I renounce my love and and 
before I take away from the life of my own child. And so that courage comes from this, this intimate, fierce love, this relentless, sometimes called reckless love of God. And I see it definitely in all that you've said, like the law, the prophets, they hang on this thing, the greatest thing, you know, and the second greatest thing, the greatest being love with God and then second love with each other. Wow. It's kind of, uh, going to be pedantic to go anywhere else after that. We do have about three minutes left. Let's go to the beast of the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let me just, let me just say a couple of things because, uh, and let me speak uh, as a seventh day Adventist here for a moment. And I, we we love it that there are people from all kinds of backgrounds who watch this program. Uh, but just want to speak for a moment. How does a seventh day Adventist look at this text? And we've mentioned the commandments of God and, and, and Seventh-day Adventists make a strong uh, emphasis on that. We've mentioned the spirit of prophecy and Adventists have understood that God has exercised that gift, particularly in the work of one Ellen G. White uh, about a hundred years ago. But more than that, when you look at the end time people of God, they have other characteristics too. There's the gospel in Revelation 10, uh, the, the, the mystery of God will be finished. That's New Testament language for the gospel. Uh, you have there an emphasis that the book of Daniel will be unearthed at the end of time, and the book of Revelation will come back and have another go at the end of time. Hmm. So Daniel and Revelation will be the focus of this end time people. Then in chapter 11, you have a view of the heavenly sanctuary. A message about a heavenly sanctuary will be there. Uh, in chapter 13, there's end-time deceptions to be warned about. Uh, in chapter 14, uh, the remnant, 144,000, will have an intimate relationship with Jesus. We'll be speaking about the time of God's judgment, and we'll have a message regarding the Sabbath, one of the Ten Commandments. So when you put all of those together, and ask yourself the question, is there any group of people in the world today that has that whole package of ideas? And Seventh-day Adventists have concluded, yes, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the one religious body that takes seriously all of those elements of the final message in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the danger. And, and, and uh, we'll get into this in the next program because we're down in our last minute. But here's the danger. The danger is when you identify yourself with something. And the, and the pioneers didn't see in the book of Revelation, oh, it's Seventh-day Adventist. No, they read the book of Revelation. They saw the end time message and said, somebody's got to give it. Why not us? Mm -hmm. So to be a Seventh-day Adventist, simply to recognize, hey, God has an end time message. And we may not do it well, but we're going to do it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's the danger of arrogance and perceived arrogance. So we want to take a closer look at this remnant concept next time around. Dig into the scriptures and see what prophetic surprises may lurk beneath the surface yet to be, un to be discovered. See you then. <laughs>